Muchas gracias por su presencia en este debate que hemos eh, querido organizar con un formato ligeramente distinto del habitual y quiero agradecer en primer lugar al embajador británico Simon Mandy por eh, habernos propuesto, también al embajador holandés por habernos propuesto esta idea en, un, en primera instancia. La idea que tenemos, como saben, es la de desarrollar una conversación, un diálogo con cuatro de los embajadores acreditados en Madrid que representan países que tienen posiciones distintas, eh, distintas entre sí y quizás también distintas de la española. Y también contamos con la presencia de Alejandro Avellán, en representación del Ministerio de Asuntos Exteriores y de Cooperación para que nos aporte la visión española. Quería hacer un par de comentarios previos. En primer lugar, eh, lógicamente no están todos los embajadores de la Unión representados eh, en este panel. A algunos, eh, lógicamente, les invitamos inicialmente, pero no pudieron eh, aceptar nuestra invitación. Otros eh, no, no querían participar en un debate de este tipo, decisión que los, nosotros, lógicamente, respetamos. Pero creemos que hemos reunido a un eh, grupo interesante, heterogéneo, y que sin duda van a aportar ideas, ideas de gran interés. Quiero subrayar también que estamos streaming esta reunión, por lo tanto recibiremos también preguntas de personas que no están en la sala y que nos están siguiendo eh, a través de, de este método y recogeremos también preguntas, por supuesto, de la sala una vez eh, hayan concluido las intervenciones de nuestros ponentes. Nuestra idea hoy es tener una conversación sobre el futuro de Europa. Quisiéramos mirar más allá de la crisis económica, quisiéramos sobre todo plantearnos una pregunta fundamental, ¿qué tipo de Europa queremos ver salir de la crisis económica actual? ¿Cómo nos gustaría que fuese la Unión Europea post-crisis? Y en relación directa con esto, ¿qué tenemos que hacer los europeos para poder configurar esa futura Europa post-crisis? ¿Cuáles son los grandes retos a los que se enfrentará la Unión Europea? a la salida de la crisis y eh, cuáles son las prioridades de los países aquí representados en relación con esas tareas futuras, esas grandes prioridades europeas. Bien, hemos pedido a cada uno de los ponentes que hable brevemente, una intervención de aproximadamente ocho minutos eh, y posteriormente entablaremos un diálogo entre ellos antes de recibir preguntas del público. Y sin más, doy la palabra a Alejandro Avellán, a quien agradezco muy especialmente su presencia esta mañana. Eh, muchas gracias, Charles. Yo quería eh, empezar, creo que se oye bien ¿no? el micrófono, quería empezar mi intervención eh, agradeciendo al Cano y, y a su director, a Charles Powell, su, su invitación para, aquí, para estar con ustedes hoy esta mañana y sobre todo la oportunidad para debatir con todos ustedes de temas de Europa en un momento en que me parece, Charles, particularmente oportuno, teniendo en cuenta el contexto eh, preelectoral europeo en el que nos encontramos y en el que yo creo que el debate informado sobre Europa y las diferentes visiones de Europa, como reza el título que hoy nos convoca aquí, pues tiene un resultado particularmente apropiado, particularmente eh, pertinente. Al hablar de, del futuro de la Unión Europea, a mí me parece que lo primero que tenemos que hacer es reflexionar un poco, ver en qué momento se encuentra la Unión Europea para ver cuál es el camino a seguir en los próximos años, ¿no? Y yo creo que la legislatura que se iniciará eh, después del 25 de mayo va a ser una legislatura muy importante porque en la agenda europea hay enormes retos. Está, en primer lugar, el reto planteado por Reino Unido sobre su eh, encaje con la Unión Europea, la Unión Europea que Reino Unido querría y en la que estaría dispuesta a participar. Está en retos sobre el cambio climático, la energía, la seguridad del abastecimiento energético. Está el reto sobre la competitividad, el mercado interior el fortalecimiento de la proyección exterior de la Unión Europea hay enorm... y, final... y sobre todo yo diría también el refuerzo de la Unión Económica y Monetaria, la continuación del proceso que hemos tenido, que hemos llevado a cabo a lo largo de los últimos años. ¿no? Y ese, 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 este momento, por tanto, es un momento crucial en el que debatir sobre Europa es importante y en el que la próxima legislatura, yo creo que será una legislatura muy importante en términos de, de, de construir Europa y de qué Europa será esa que construyamos. ¿no? Y para iniciar la reflexión, yo creo que el mejor, el mejor punto de partida del inicio de la reflexión es, eh, es lo que hemos hecho en estos dos últimos años. ¿Qué hemos hecho a raíz de que surgiera la crisis económica y financiera en el año 2007 y el, la, la manera en que hemos abordado esa crisis económica y financiera? 
Y lo, hemos, y lo hemos abordado a partir, yo creo, que de un cierto consenso entre los socios de la Unión y ese consenso se, se sustancia en el hecho de que, eh, muchas veces repetido, de que la Unión Económica y Monetaria eh, se asentaba sobre unos cimientos débiles. No eran unos cimientos suficientes, la zona euro no es una zona monetaria óptima, es una... Se, se asienta sobre cimientos que son débiles, que no, que no eh, responden a los retos a los que se enfrenta. Y eso ha provocado, en definitiva, es lo que explica, en definitiva, la gravedad, la agudeza con lo que se ha sentido la crisis en términos financieros, pero también en términos económicos y, yo diría, también en términos sociales. ¿no? Eh, y eso es así porque es verdad que el Tratado de Maastricht ha dibujado una política monetaria de, de corte federal con un con una moneda única y con un Banco Central Europeo que dirige una política monetaria única para todos los socios de la zona euro, pero ello no se venía, no llevaba acompañado pues, de los mecanismos de coordinación económica y fiscal o de refuerzo de la competitividad que hubiesen, hecho, que hubiesen sido necesarios para evitar crisis de naturaleza simétrica como la que hemos padecido en estos últimos años. Junto a ese análisis, que yo creo que es un análisis compartido, no es novedoso ni creo que sea polémico, también hay otro elemento que tampoco creo que sea polémico, que es que la manera de superar esa situación también se ha compartido por los socios. Y eso se concretó en el, las conclusiones del Consejo Europeo de diciembre de 2012, donde se mandató al presidente Van Rompuy para que estableciera una, una hoja de ruta completa para el refuerzo de la Unión Económica y Monetaria, hoja de ruta que fue luego avalada por el Consejo Europeo, aprobada por el Consejo Europeo, de junio de 2013 y que es la hoja de ruta que ha marcado los trabajos en estos últimos años. ¿Qué decía esa hoja de ruta? Pues esa hoja de ruta decía que había que trabajar en cuatro ejes fundamentales. Una mayor integración financiera, una mayor integración fiscal, una mayor integración económica y finalmente, y como corolario de todo lo anterior, una necesaria mayor integración política. Creo que a día de hoy, cuando está a punto de terminarse la legislatura europea, el balance, lo digo... Eh, lo digo con, con, con claridad, creo que el balance es positivo. Creo que en los últimos años Europa ha avanzado mucho y que esa roja de ruta se ha cumplido después de debates enormemente difíciles en los que hay presentes intereses muy importantes, pero se ha cumplido en un porcentaje enormemente elevado. Tenemos un mecanismo, un, un mecanismo único de supervisión bancaria, tenemos un mecanismo, una autoridad que va a dirigir que va a supervisar a, a los bancos de la zona euro y a aquellos Estados miembros que participan en el mecanismo. Tenemos una autoridad única sobre, liquidar, eh, sobre cómo liquidar a los bancos. Tenemos un fondo único de reestructuración sobre cómo, eh, para llevar a cabo las inyecciones de capital en aquellos bancos que tengan problemas de solvencia o de liquidez. Tenemos unas normas comunes que hemos aprobado mediante directiva sobre cómo enfocar esos procesos de liquidación bancaria, los procesos de quitas, primero los acreedores, los, de, los tenedores de deuda senior, los tenedores de deuda junior y finalmente solamente los, los contribuyentes a través de los presupuestos nacionales o europeos. Y por tanto hemos avanzado mucho en todo el mundo de un mercado financiero más integrado, que es fundamental para recuperar el crédito y para evitar la fragmentación del mercado europeo, que es un gran problema. Tenemos también un mecanismo en el ámbito fiscal eh, mecanismos mucho más eh, poderosos de control de las finanzas públicas nacionales, sobre todo a través del, del paquete de dos reglamentos llamado TUPAC, que exige que los Estados miembros presenten sus anteproyectos de presupuestos nacionales a Bruselas, a la Comisión, antes de que, de que se, se presenten a los, eh, a los parlamentos nacionales para su aprobación definitiva. Y tenemos también en marcha todo un proceso para una mayor de coordinación de políticas económicas que se sustanció en un primer momento en el Fiscal Compact, en el tratado que se acordó en, en diciembre de 2011 y que eh, esperamos ver mayores progresos en, 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 en octubre de este año, el Consejo de Productores de este año, sobre cómo coordinar mejor las medidas de política económica de los Estados miembros que tienen un efecto que supera el marco nacional, si tiene una incidencia en el conjunto de la economía europea o en otros Estados miembros y, sobre todo, en cómo esa mayor coordinación de las medidas económicas nacionales deben venir acompañadas también de incentivos eh, europeos. Eh, ¿Cuál es la filosofía básica de todo este proceso? Mayor integración financiera, mayor integración fiscal, mayor integración económica. ¿Cuál es, al final, cuál es el, el, la ratio que explica todo el proceso? 
o que de alguna manera sirve para articular todo el proceso. Yo creo que es una idea bastante simple, que está articulando todos los documentos del Consejo Europeo, del presidente Van Rompuy, el debate europeo. La idea de que, eh, primero, para salir de la crisis no hacía falta menos Europa, hacía falta más Europa. Yo creo que nadie se ha planteado en términos eh, con un mínimo de seriedad que la superación de la crisis se podía llevar a cabo mediante menos Europa. Al revés, lo que se ha puesto de manifiesto es que había deficiencias y que ha hecho falta más Europa y sigue haciendo falta más Europa para salir de la crisis y, sobre todo, para impedir que se repitan crisis de la misma naturaleza en el futuro. Primer elemento, yo creo. Segundo elemento, eh, hace falta eh, un proceso en el que estamos mutualizando decisiones y estamos haciendo los Estados miembros unas transferencias muy notables de nuestra soberanía nacional. Lo hacemos cuando remitimos a la Comisión nuestros anteproyectos de presupuesto nacional, lo hacemos cuando decidimos que no sean las autoridades nacionales las que supervisan los bancos, cuando no sean las autoridades nacionales los que decidan cómo liquidar un banco, eh, lo hacemos cuando ponemos en manos de un proceso de coordinación europea nuestras medidas económicas, nuestras medidas de, de, de reforma económica a través de todo el proceso de todo el proceso del semestre europeo y, por tanto, estamos eh, mutualizando decisiones. A nosotros nos parece, y este es el punto de vista español, nos parece que esa mutualización de decisiones, que es necesaria, porque la crisis lo ha puesto de manifiesto, debe llevar, con, debe llevar aparejada también una mutualización del riesgo. Y eso quiere decir eh, que si mutualizamos la decisión, que si no es la autoridad nacional la que decide, sino que es la autoridad europea la que decide, eso tiene que eh, conllevar también una mutualización, de, una mutualización del riesgo, una mutualización del riesgo en términos de cómo se inyecta capital a los bancos, en términos de eh, solidaridad con los Estados miembros a en, en los diferentes programas de rescate, en términos en el futuro, y entiendo que esto es un tema polémico, pero que nosotros, es una propuesta que defendemos en términos de emisiones conjunta de deuda, y a su vez, esa mutualización de decisiones y mutualización de riesgo, entendemos que solo puede tener contexto en un proyecto democrático como es el proyecto europeo, mediante una profundización de la democracia europea. Y ahí entramos en todo el debate sobre la unión política, que, que como todo este proceso de mayor integración en todos estos ámbitos, a su vez genera la necesidad de una mayor legitimidad democrática de las instituciones de la Unión, de esas instituciones que toman decisiones cada vez más importantes sobre cómo liquidar bancos, sobre cómo eh, aprobar los presupuestos nacionales, sobre qué reformas económicas hay que introducir por parte de los miembros, esas autoridades europeas tienen que estar sometidas a un mayor control democrático, a una mayor legitimidad democrática. Y ahí se abre todo un, todo un capítulo sobre eh, qué legitimidad democrática para las instituciones, qué debate político, que es precisamente quizá pues la parte que está más atrasada de todo el proceso, porque, y yo, yo creo que está bien que esté más atrasada, yo creo que está más atrasada porque es la consecuencia de, no es lo que inicia el proceso, es lo que es la consecuencia de todo ese proceso. ¿no? Y es algo sobre lo que podemos luego hablar en el debate, si el público y los contertulios lo estiman adecuado. ¿no? Estupendo, muchas gracias Alejandro. Uh, we have asked today's speakers to, to speak in whichever language they prefer, whichever language they feel more comfortable in. Justin is not going to speak in Gaelic, don't worry. Um, he speaks excellent Spanish, but he's going to show off uh, his linguistic skills. Um, so we've already heard a little about economic and monetary union and the challenges that this will pose for political union. We've, we have called this session, indeed, Visions for Europe, because we're assuming that there are different... Uh, visions for Europe, and I think Alejandro has given us a very eloquent and, and convincing account of the traditional Spanish position on many of these challenges, and I'm sure that we will hear a variety of views in the course of the morning. Justin Harman, Irish Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, reflecting on the title of visions, um, it reminded me of the uh, comment I think made by a senior German politician when asked about his vision for Europe, and he said people with visions should uh, seek uh, an appointment with their doctors. Um, I, I, in our case, we believe that there is a need for a vision, there is a need for a sh clear, shared narrative, uh, and the European Union, the European Parliament elections are, are, are important in shaping that uh, narrative. Why do we need a shared, shared narrative? Why do we need a vision? In part, it's to do about with ensuring popular consent 
and ensuring democratic legitimacy for this project. A project that is not explained is not a project that's going to command uh, legitimacy and, and consent. Um, our vision of Europe has very much been uh, uh, shaped by, first of all, 40 years of membership of the, of the communities and then the union, and, of, and secondly, by the recent experiences. Both are important. I thought I'd talk a little about that. Um, the, first of all, how the mem membership had transformed Ireland, modernised Ireland, uh, secondly, and indeed is continuing to do so. Secondly, how it is, has been an essential factor in our emergence from the crisis. Uh, thirdly, perspectives on the future direction of the Union. And on this, I would like to just refer in particular to the relationship between um, Ireland and the United Kingdom and the impact of the debate in the United Kingdom uh, on, uh, on, on Europe generally and specifically on Ireland. And finally, a sense of the immediate uh, challenges that uh, we think the Union faces. Just briefly on Ireland and the EU, 40 years ago, 1973, we entered a, uh, a community as a completely different country. It was a, uh, a country which... Uh, uh, was um, in many ways, uh, well, for example, in, in terms of income, it was 60% uh, of the uh, European average. It's now 25% above the average. We have created um, an economy that's now one of the most open, and this was in large part because of what membership meant. But it isn't only about economics or finance, actually. It's, it's, it was about the change that uh, took place in improving daily lives in lots of different ways. For example, in environment, gender equality, workers' rights, education. The entire range of uh, aspects of the functioning of society have been hugely transformed for the better by our membership of the Union. Uh, we, uh, we continue to believe that it, the Union is the, the best um, vehicle uh, to, to advance our, our national interests. And um, we've, our seventh presidency last year again confirmed um, the, the centrality of the, the Union uh, for us. It's important because it has changed the political and cultural horizons. It allowed Ireland to reset its relationship in many ways with um, the United Kingdom, and it was important also in the context of the peace process in Northern Ireland. Um, we consulted our people um, when we joined. We, a, a large majority, voted in, in, in favour. The basis, uh, impeccable logic, was that if the people uh, gave their consent to cede sovereignty to the Union, then uh, if you ask for more sovereign to be ceded, then you must ask them again. And that is the basis on which we have held a number of referenda on the uh, on European Union treaties, uh, two of which, Nice and Lisbon, there was a negative result, um, and um, th that, that they were subsequently overturned in subsequent referenda. But the important point is uh, that we, uh, it, it is not a Euroscepticism that led to those uh, results. There has been a false impression, in the in sense, created of, a, uh, of Euroscepticism in Ireland. In fact, the reason is, and this goes to the heart, I think, of the future vision, is that we, we are, we have a union of sovereign states. They, we, in Ireland, there is acute attention on the balance between the identity and competence of the national state and competencies that are ceded to the union. And this, we think, is a point linked to the fundamental question of democratic legitimacy. But that balance in looking to the future, that balance between those two elements are central to our vision of what the future will, will hold. Just briefly on recovery, uh, it has been a traumatic period, rather like Spain. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen an economic <coughs> contraction without precedent in terms of employment, in terms of um, social cohesion. That said, significant progress is being made. Situation is still very fragile. Uh, the, um, we've exited a program in terms of bond yields, in terms of meeting Maastricht criteria, uh, and most importantly in em employment, where employment, uh, is, unemployment rather, is now below the um, European Union average. Um, why? Because there was an acceptance, basically, that there were serious uh, 
errors, homegrown, domestic errors in regulation, which contributed to this, ensuring that there was an acceptance that the errors were not somebody else's. They were errors that were made by us. That was very important, and that uh, ha is, of course, balanced in, in a sense, too, by a, an acceptance that there were also errors that are Im the impact of systemic errors that were made in the design of the currency, and that is, of course, something that uh, Alejandro has just spoken about. The balance between these two is important. Um, significant changes have been made in terms of competitiveness and um, the way our public sector is functioning. Overall, uh, progress, uh, fragile, huge concentration on ensuring that the uh, union um, keeps to its commitments, particularly in relation to uh, area, areas like the, um, the banking union and, um, and advancing EMU. Can I say very briefly, we are an island behind another island. Uh, so naturally, when we look to Europe, uh, we, have, we look through uh, the, um, the island um, beside us, uh, and um, a major uncertainty for us, obviously, is the outcome of the current debate in the United Kingdom. Um, we share a border on the same island. We an extraordinary scale and breadth of interrelationship, economic, political, social. Um, the UK is Ireland's most important market, and we are, Ireland is the UK's fifth lar largest market, with the UK exporting more to us than to China, India, and Brazil combined, I read. So common, common membership of the, U the Union has been um, vital in, uh, in transforming the relationship uh, between the islands, uh, including, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the peace process in Northern Ireland. So therefore, it is inevitable that the British uh, debate, or the outcome of this debate, could have a significant uh, impact um, on, on Ireland. Um, but rather than talk about the impact on Ireland or indeed the um, impact uh, on Britain itself, it's the impact, we think, of uh, any possible departure of the United Kingdom from the uh, European Union, the impact on the Union itself. We think it would be significantly weakening to the, to the Union if the UK were not a member. Uh, and um, we, we, uh, we think that... One, an important point is that many of the points that are, are made on the reform agenda made by Britain, made by the United Kingdom, are in fact um, essential for, for, the, um, for the future union. I give you the example of the relationship between the, uh, those who are members of the common currency and those um, who are not. We cannot build an effective uh, union, a, f a future union, that... Is, has this major fissure running through it. And that was why it was very important when um, Wolfgang Schäuble and, um, and George Osborne last week committed themselves to, to this issue. I mean, this is uh, important, a guarantee of fairness, and it's, it's something which uh, needs attention outside um, the, those two countries. Just looking to the future, I'm not sure, are you keeping your time? Um, the... Uh, Strategic um, priorities for the future, I mean, first of all, the vision, again, coming back to this, this word vision, needs to be focused on, uh, on recovery, especially for those countries who have been most impacted by this crisis. Recovery, and that means growth. It means um, competitive, competitiveness. It means a, um, a strengthening and not in any sense a, a dilution uh, of, the, of the union. But... We think it's important that it, be, uh, it not be a, an institution-led discussion. It has to be policy-led. We shouldn't confuse changes in the institutions with um, changes in, uh, in, in, um, it, it, with, with real reform. Uh, we need to deepen the single market. We need, whatever happens about future treaty reform, we need to use the current treaties. They have significant room uh, for, for, for us. Uh, we think there needs to be uh, points mentioned by Alejandro on energy, for example, and Ukraine has, again, thrust this issue into the, into the forefront, and indeed climate change, but again. Uh, strong implementation of the Eurozone governance mechanisms. Um, international trade, a focus point. We're 
focusing obviously our attention on uh, TTIP with the United States, but of course we have excellent um, uh, models to look at in terms of the agreements with uh, Canada, Singapore and Korea. Uh, um, this is a, a key factor for, for future growth. Very briefly on uh, banking union, I, I won't go into the detail Alejandro did on the, uh, on the future, but one point that is important is that uh, we need this completed, we need commitments to be met on, uh, bank, uh, uh, on the banking union. There was an agreement made uh, at heads of state and government level that there would be a link, uh, rather the link between the, um, the banking debt and the sovereign would be broken. That has not happened. And we, we will not make it happen unless we complete uh, this agenda. If that happens, we need to revert to the issue of bank, the, uh, bank re the cost of bank recapitalization and the legacy debts that have, have arisen uh, as a result of the, the crisis. Uh, and this is something certainly that from our point of view will be central to any, any, any future um, uh, of the um, future vision. Briefly, subsidiarity, uh, this is not a matter sometimes confused with of more Europe or less Europe. It's a question of better Europe ensuring that the EU does the right things at the right level. It'll be another important element in the formulation of, of this uh, vision for the future. Finally, I wasn't going to talk about institutions, but I'm just picking up a, on this point from Alejandro's um, presentation. Um, the future of the Commission. This is an institutional point of uh, particular importance um, uh, to, um, to the future. We do not believe that any changes should uh, in any sense compromise the Commission's independence and right of initiative. Uh, and the retention of a Commissioner uh, by Member States we see as uh, essential in preserving the legitimacy of the institutions. So yes to ideas um, to, on improved efficiency, uh, but no to measures that dilute dilute the Commission's legitimacy and independence. Just one final point on a project for peace. Because we've been so focused on the crisis, because uh, the impact has been so severe, we have sometimes forgotten how uh, essential the European Union is as a project for peace. And in many ways, it was um, Crimea the annexation, the forced annexation of uh, an independent part of an independent state in Europe, which has, in a way, focused our attention again on on this um, on this key detail, and it's very important we 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 continue to to focus. This is not just simply about economics uh, and about uh, finance. It, it's uh, it continues to be a project for peace. I finish up with a quote from. Uh, a, the great Scottish philosopher David Hume, who said, it's when we start working together that the real healing takes place. It's when we start spilling our sweat and not our blood. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you for putting, putting so much meat on the Irish bone. Um, you've raised a lot of interesting issues, which I'm sure um, other people will, will return to. Um, the tension between the Eurozone and non-Eurozone members, the EU's reform agenda, the tension between new policies and institution, institutional uh, reform, and also uh, TTIP, which will no doubt figure later as well. Um, Cecilia Junin from the Swedish Embassy, you have the floor. Thank you. thank you very much, Charles, and thank you, the Elcano Institute, for having invited Sweden to this eminent uh, panel. Um, if I should summarize the, the Swedish vision for, for Europe, uh, I could do it in, in three words. We would like to see uh, a Europe that is strong, united, and open. Um, and I think we would see, like to see a union that is strong on quality rather than, than quantity. Uh, that's not the important thing. And we would like to see an, a very effective and innovative uh, union. Um, that would be sort of my start for, for the vision of it. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, I come from a country, Sweden, that has been characterized by a certain EU skepticism uh, even since we started. 
Um, <clears throat> we had a referendum in 1994 uh, before joining the Union. Uh, I would say it was a referendum that was very much an economic discussion. The Swedish industry had already joined the Union. 70% of our exports went to the European <laughs> Union. And I would say the Swedes were the Swedes were doing a balance sheet. Would we gain more economically by joining than, than not joining? And, and that, I think, affected our discussion a little bit. Well, we did join. Uh, a good 52% said yes, uh, but a good 47% uh, said, said no. But we did uh, join. And we have been sort of, I would say, wondering about our, our membership a little bit uh, since. Uh, I would say we are more comfortable being members now. Um, having been a member for, for 20 years, uh, and today we have the latest poll said 42% think we should stay in the European Union, 25% say we should leave the European Union, but one third of the voters are, haven't really made up their mind what they <coughs> think about it. Uh, so it's still a little bit a torn country. And I mean, um, compared to Spain, we are not in the Eurozone, and that probably will also mark my comments a little bit, uh, that we're not in that big uh, project. Uh, the Swedish parliament decided that we should have a referendum on, on joining the Euro, which we had in 2003. Uh, and the yes side lost with quite a clear margin. 56% said no. Uh, and I have to <laughs> say, unfortunately, the, the opinion hasn't changed for the better since then. Today, 76% say we should not join the Eurozone and only 9% in Sweden think it would be a good idea. Uh, but So we'll, we'll take that discussion uh, later on. <coughs> and we, we do still have some, some skeptical EU parties, our left party, the former communists, are, are strongly anti-EU, I would say. Uh, our, and strangely enough, our Green Party is also very skeptical about belonging to the, to the EU. Uh, and we have also um, a rather new populist party, rather xenophobic party, that is also skeptical in the EU. And, but unfortunately, when we look at the polls now coming up to the European elections, that's one of the parties that are raising their, their poll figures, which is a bit. But I think it should be said that the large dominant Swedish parties are pro-EU, and I would say strongly committed to Sweden being uh, a committed, solidaric, um, active uh, EU member state. Um, and I would like to come back to that on, on being a solidaric. We are sometimes accused of, of sort of being a little bit isolated up in the north, uh, egoistic. We are still, we haven't been affected so negatively by the euro crisis. Um, but I would like to take the opportunity to say that I, we, we would like to be, and I think we are, a very solidary EU member. We have been net contributors since the beginning, and that is fine with us. No one is taking a debate. We should be. We, we have the wealth uh, to do it. Uh, although we sometimes would like to say that solidarity is not only uh, economic transfers. It's also that we all live by the common rules that we have decided on. We fulfill our commitments and, and we stand uh, together. And that we sometimes put the national interest a little bit aside for, for the common good of, of the union. So is there a future for the European Union? Uh, well, our vision is that there certainly is. But we think that there is a future for a strong European Union that really dedicates itself to the issues where it's competent and where it can deliver a strong added value for, for its uh, citizens. Uh, for us, it's, in, it's important that we focus on the issues where we can contribute efficiently, and especially where cross-border cooperation is necessary for, for, the, the, for solutions. And I think we touched upon, Alejandro touched upon, I mean, in, in the economic sphere, it's, it's clear that we need to work very unitedly. Uh, we talk about the four freedoms of the European Union, which is crucial for all growth and, and, and job creation, that we have the four freedoms of free movement, of, of goods and services, of, of people and, and labor um, and capital. Uh, we have mentioned the issue of environment and climate change. Uh, it's necessary. Cross-border criminality is an issue that is coming up uh, very much and where we need to work closely together. Migration and immigration, which is also a touchy <laughs> issue at times, but where we need to, to cooperate. Um, I would like to mention also the, the foreign and security policy, which is an area, especially in these days when we have <coughs> crisis coming closer and closer to, to our borders, um, where we have strengthened, we are strong believers in, in a strong and, and further developed uh, European action service, 
European External Action Service. Um, Sweden was happy to cooperate with, with Spain and with Italy and, and Poland on, on taking a, writing a paper on, on a European global strategy for the future, how we can work more efficiently in that. I'm also very proud to say that Sweden is one of the founding members of the European Institute for Peace, which will probably take its first steps and be launched later this uh, spring. So that's a very important area, I think, for, for the Union. Uh, just a few words on, on the Economic and Monetary Union. As we're not members of the Eurozone, we're not at the table when the real group is talking about the development, but I would like to stress that we are, are, are I think, cooperating and trying to cooperate constructively in the, in the discussions to shape it. We, we think it, it needs to be, be formed. Um, our one concern, and I think we may share it with other <laughs> members of the panel, we would like to see that whatever is done in that area in, in the monetary and banking union, that it doesn't affect negatively the non-members of the Eurozone and that it doesn't affect negatively our way of working in the internal market. That's, I think, is a very basic uh, line for us. Um, and I should like to state also that, I mean, we are not interested in opening up or renegotiating treaties at this uh, stage. We think it's rather the time to use what we have and focus on using what we have in a more efficient way. Um, we, we think there's still room to implement the principle of subsidiarity and proportionality uh, in an even more focused way. Uh, I have our European minister said um, the other week that we think the EU should be large on large big issues and it should be smaller on, on the little ones. Uh, and we should handle the issue at, at the lowest possible level, be it sometimes it's necessary the European level, sometimes it's the national level, or sometimes it's the municipal level. So let's not elevate it when it's not necessary. Uh, a few words on legitimacy. Uh, I think we are all worried a little about the, the gap that has emerged or, or is sometimes even widening between the citizens and, and, and the European Union, the institutions uh, of the European Union. And especially among men, many young uh, people, we have to strive to make it relevant and, and interesting and accessible for everyone. Um, there's a worrying trend we have seen in the, the participation in the EU elections. Um, in, in many places, there's a downward trend in, in the participation. Uh, in my country, it happened to go up in 2009 uh, to 45%, uh, but we're very worried that we won't keep that. And still, for us, 45% is a low figure. I know it's a good one in, in, in EU terms, but I think we all have to work for, for increasing the participation. Otherwise, there's a risk that the more extreme parties are the ones that will get their voters to, to, to the polls. Um, so it's necessary to bridge this um, imagined or, or gap that has uh, come up between citizens and institutions. Um, and how can we do that? Well, uh, Swedes are always optimistic and uh, we have one solution to a lot of problems. And uh, we are fundamentalists when it comes to issues of transparency and openness. And we think that can carry us a long way also in increasing the legitimacy of, of the European Union. I think we need to give people the, the, the possibility and the instruments to, to scrutinize and follow in a better way the processes within uh, the European Union. Uh, we think transparency is the best way to open up the EU for, for its citizens, which in its turn will increase the, the democratic um, accountability. It will also, I think, give greater efficiency, because if you know you're scrutinized, you tend to do things in a more uh, efficient way. And we think it will generally improve the quality of, of decision making. Um, so we would like to strengthen very practically the, the public's ask, access to, to documents, to public access to documentation in, in the institutions, in the Commission and in the Council and, and in the Parliament. Um, we would maybe like to see some <clears throat> kind of administrative regulation that would really regulate the rights of the citizens to have access um, to the institutions uh, in the Union. Um, and I think we, we would like to see, and I think as, as Justin was saying, we would like to see a strong and independent uh, Commission. Uh, we would like to see a strong European Parliament and we would like to see a strong Council of Ministers, but they should all be much more open uh, than they are today. 
And as I said, we would like to see a strong, united and open EU for the future. Uh, I think we need to strengthen our efforts to act in a united manner. Uh, I think for the EU to be relevant, especially in, in the field of external relations, uh, it's sometimes necessary for member states to abstain from taking national initiatives and, and act unilaterally in order to coordinate with other member states. Um, a disunited EU, when we sometimes speak with different voices, send uh, a signal of, of, of weakness to the outside world. While when we stand united, as I think we have done recently on the Ukraine issue, we give a very powerful and, and strong message. Uh, and we also provide a good and attractive image of the European Union uh, to the outside world. Um, <coughs> and, um, well, here just to, to say two words of, of, uh, on, on the UK, as we don't have the same uh, relation uh, as Ireland, but Sweden has always, I think, been a, a strong partner, a good ally of the United States, uh, of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Uh, especially in economic issues, and, and uh, therefore we are a little bit worried, I have to say, on the discussion that is going on in, in the United Kingdom, and we would like to see uh, a committed and strong United Kingdom staying with us in, in the Union. And just to finalize, I would like to quote uh, my foreign minister uh, just said the other week, Carl Bildt, that a weakened Europe uh, is down, downright dangerous in, in these times. Um, and I couldn't agree with him more. I think we need a strong union. We need a united um, union. And we think we need a union that do the things it's supposed to do in a better way uh, than it does today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Justin, you quoted David Hume. Uh, Cecilia quotes uh, Carl Bildt, who's <laughs> a classic author. Um, we won't have our master. Absolutely. <laughs> And Cecilia has raised, I think, a number of very interesting issues. First of all, it's so refreshing to hear someone say, I'm a ne net contributor, so what? You know? Um, are there any Catalans in the room? Um, secondly, I think she made, she made a very interesting point by raising the CFSP dimension, which we, I hope, will discuss a little bit more. I was very struck recently when a very senior uh, Swedish government official said, we don't need to join NATO because we are members of the European Union which I think is, again, an interesting uh, take. And she has also stressed uh, the importance of transparency and accountability, which is music to my ears, and I'm sure to Alejandro's ears as well, um, since the Spanish government should probably be doing a lot more on that front, both at home and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, we now have the Dutch ambassador, Cornelius van Riech. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charles, and... Uh uh, Alcano for organizing this uh, event. I think it's a very good moment to compare notes on the, the very important issue of uh, European elections and what's on the agenda in the coming period, where do we come from. Um, also, uh, I agree with Justin that uh, visions, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you have to go to see a doctor if you have too many visions. I think it was Helmut Schmidt actually who said that, uh, a wise older politician these days. Um, but uh, there is some truth in the term uh, visions. You know, you have to be careful because uh, it's somewhat overstated, of course, but the essence is that we need concrete policies that can be implemented and that are concrete, uh, basically. Um, uh, this is what our citizens need. This is what all of us need. Um, I'm from a member state uh, that has been there since the very beginning, early 50s, uh, basically let's say until uh, 2005, there was a broad consensus on, uh, let's say, basically Europe is good. And since the famous referendum in France and the Netherlands, there are doubts. Not so, but not so much about Europe, but about how we are going to deal with a number of issues in a uh, increasingly uh, also democratic environment. And uh, so there are two main things, I think, from our perspective that we will have to deal with. One is we have to solve these internal issues with, uh, with, within the EU, uh, question of transparency, democratic legitimacy, and it, certainly also taking some of the critical voices, some of them are even anti-European or very Eurosceptic, we have to listen to them, we have to take them seriously, because they underpin uh, things that are alive in our societies, not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe or Brussels, but also within our own societies. Uh, that have to be uh, dealt with. Um, 
the debate that we are, uh, would like to see, and some of it has found its way through a debate on subsidiarity and more democratic legitimacy, these are debates that we want to conduct with 28 member states and preferably without treaty change and preferably including the United Kingdom, of course, uh, in the longer term to stay with us because we need uh, the refreshing and, uh, let's say, positive policies of, 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 of the UK to, um, to be in Europe. Um, so, for us, uh, one of the questions we would ask is, uh, why is there so much uh, lack of confidence these days? Uh, in some countries more than in others, but there is a certain unease. And uh, there are some elements that we, uh, we believe are important have to be taken uh, into account. Uh, really, we live now for the first time, uh, we see a generation of people that are worried about the future and fear that their children won't be able to enjoy the same prosperity and benefits as they did. This is a new fact, and we see this in almost all member states. In the past, everybody always thought things were going to be better, and now for the first time we are let's say, confronted by uh, challenges that may give us the feeling that things will not be better in the future. Um, so, more insecurity. And, and young people all around Europe are unsatisfied about the economic situation. There are, in some countries, huge uh, youth unemployment, in particular, of course, in the country where, where we live now, but also in a number of other countries. But more broadly, how are we going to earn our money in the future uh, with all the uh, enormous developments we see worldwide, uh, the rest of the world, Asia, of course. Uh, it's essential that we, uh, we, f we define the right model of society jointly to, to tackle that, uh, that issue, which is much more than competitivity. I mean, there's a few other things there that we have to deal with. Um, there is also a, a lack of confidence by many European, pe European people in uh, what we see is what we call commonly Brussels, which is not fair because Brussels is all of us, but that's how we call it. We see a certain gap between Brussels and people in member states. Uh, we believe this happens on three levels. Uh, first one, I would call the level of input. What happens to my voice in Brussels when my government or my ministers or others negotiate on my behalf? Is a question of the problem of output the EU promises more than it can do, very often, or it doesn't pro promise enough, or it's too vague. And there is the problem of what we call throughput. No one really understands how it works. There's a sort of problem of democratic deficit there. We, we have to tackle those things, and there is a bit of squaring of the, uh, of the circle there. Uh, it's very difficult. There are no clear answers to that, but maybe a number of suggestions that I will focus on right now. Um, uh, and as I said, we have to take serious the voices that, that uh, come out with these, with these important doubts. Uh, in our view, it's not about uh, no Europe or Europe. It's certainly also not about more Europe or less Europe. It's about better Europe, as my neighbor also said. And this is one of the key words we have also used in our debate on what we call subsidiarity. Um, so what should we do? Well, there are three things that we, have focused, we are focusing on, and actually they were quite well worded in an article that was written both by Minister Steinmeier and Minister Timmermans, of my, of my, the foreign ministers of Germany and the Netherlands, in a German newspaper, which I will briefly quote from. We need, first of all, um, to, um, uh, to, to, to build more confidence in the European project. How do we do that? First one, we need to focus. Now, this sounds very very simple, but we have to really tackle uh, the big issues that we can only get to grips with if we stand together. And this links up to the remark, the very just remark of President of the Commission Barroso who said we have to be big on the big things and small on the small things. Subsidiarity is a two-way street in that sense. It sounds very simple, but this is essential. So we should see a European Commission that doesn't deal with little olive bottles, they didn't, but in the end, but there was this impression, and doesn't deal with the, with, with the big issues. So we need to focus. The second thing is we need to be strong in implementation. We need strong and efficient European institutions to ensure that we successfully implement what we decide, and not decide something that will not be implemented. And the third one is we need to uphold the legitimacy of European decision-making. And that means we need a good functioning European Parliament, a strong European focus of our national parliaments, 
in scrutinizing respective governments' actions in Brussels. One of the shortcomings from the very beginning on has been that the, the role of national parliaments has been almost completely absent in the whole European construction, as we have seen it from the early 50s on. There have been debates about giving national parliaments uh, uh, a more explicit role, uh, but this is again, as far as we are concerned, on the table now, because we cannot have a situation whereby they are completely outside. And we have to, to, to formulate uh, uh, better ways uh, doing that, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, included some elements in the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, actually already in the uh, Constitutional Treaty before, but improved in the Lisbon Treaty, uh, in particular on the subsidiarity issue, but uh, we have to see if we can do a little bit more in order to keep, to keep those who represent our peoples in our nations closer to uh, the European decision uh, level. Uh, we want, and I would like to stress this once again, we want a strong Europe and a strong Europe that needs a well-positioned and well-functioning commission. A commission that is independent and strong and is the right of initiative and which can deliver the right priorities. Our aim is not a minimal EU, but an optimal EU, uh, being more effective and more selective. We want a Europe that serves and helps member states. Now, this is also stating a little bit the obvious, but it must be a Europe that contributes to solving problems that influence our daily lives. And we think that European citizens demand more transparency, focus and results from Europe in getting growth and jobs and other issues in life. Not only in Europe, they do it even at home. And this is something that cannot be separated. Uh, the, the discussions at home are very much linked to discussions we see also, and we need to find uh, solutions on the European level. And to do that, we have to bring Europe closer to the public and the public or the citizens and the citizens closer to Europe. And therefore, we believe the, the three core institutions, the European Parliament, the Council and the Commission should work in a much closer connected way. And one of the proposals that was made also by my minister in an article in the Financial Times some time, time ago, would it not be a good idea that uh, after the elections, the, 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 the three main institutions write a kind of broad program for the coming years, a program with a number of priorities, not just dry legislation, but a, a, well, a vision in a way. Where are we going in the, in the coming five years? Of course, there will always be events that will intervene, but it's very important that the public sees that that's where the decisions are taken, and this is where the, 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 the sense of direction should, uh, should emanate from. Uh, so it would add to le legitimacy, we think. Isolation is, of course, no solution. Uh, member states that withdraw. Uh, we, we have some uh, political uh, currents in my country that have been proposing that. We don't think that is a solution. We think it's a complete fata morgana, and those voices uh, promise we will go back to some sort of idealistic world that we had in the 50s or even before. Uh, and they promise, and that world, of course, never existed, and they promise a world in the future that will never exist. So it's important to take a distance from that as well. So that concerns the, what we believe the internal agenda. Now, all this is necessary to have a stronger uh, position of Europe in the world. I've said already something about it. Recovery is essential. We have discussed, I'm not going to repeat, banking union, uh, more uh, economic cooperation and, and the uh, sustainability agenda. We have to, to, to tackle those. We have to work on, on those premises. We have to work on our competitiveness, but not just that. We have to invest in technology, talent, innovation, research, and adjust our financial structures, our welfare state, our labor market. We're doing all those things. It will take time. From our perspective as a trading nation, and, and our biggest markets are in Europe, this is absolutely essential. We should not underestimate that we are stalled, we are behind, we are losing ground. Uh, the uh, Indian economy has risen by one-third since the crisis started, and the Chinese economy has grown by 70%. Uh, and uh, so we are losing ground, also demographically. So we, we have to keep all that in mind. Uh, and I'd like to quote also here a, 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 uh, something that one hears a lot uh, in the discussions. Europe, with 7% of the world population, spends 50% of the global social welfare spending. This is something serious. We have to, to, to be aware that there are challenges that we have to deal with. Um, in that respect, we have to be sure that we enlarge our, uh, let's say, our type of society, our model with our rules, 
with, in particular with the, uh, the transatlantic um, uh, trading uh, uh, partnership, with the, the TTIP, with the, with the US, and of course all the countries that, uh, like Canada and others, that we have been negotiating with to, to these free trade agree free, uh, deep free trade agreements. Why is this so important? This is important because if we create this big market, we have an agreement also on the rules and the arbitration rules that are so essential for international trade and investments. This is essential, and I would like to uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, um, the Dutch debate on Europe is certainly has always been an interesting one, and it's becoming a particularly interesting one in, in the current climate. So thank you very much for your thoughts and for stressing the input-output throughput dilemmas. Also, uh, reiterating the importance you attach to the presence of a strong commission, which the CDO also mentioned. Um, and it's an important point to make. Uh, the fact that the Netherlands has this debate does not mean that their uh, commitment to a strong, effective Europe is, is weakening uh, on the contrary. And last, but by no means least, we have the British Ambassador, Simon Manley. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Charles, um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, first of all, for organising uh, this event today. I think as uh, the previous speaker's comments have indicated, this is an incredibly timely debate. It's a really important debate for us to be having, not just here, not just here, but in every capital of every member state of the European Union, in every town hall, in every village hall across the European Union, for us to think about what sort of European Union we want for the 21st century. And let's just, and I'll say, I'm, I believe in visions. Sorry, how much read? I believe in visions. My government <laughs> believes uh, in visions, and we believe in a vision for the European Union for the 21st uh, century. And let's just step back a, a second, if we can, to think of the 20th century, and to think that what Europe and the European Union brought to all of us citizens of that European Union in the 20th century. And Justin's touched on some of it in terms of the historical relationship between the UK and Ireland, but let's just step back a moment to think of a European community as it then was that was formed out of the rubble, out of the rubble of a continent scarred by two world wars, of a European Union that responded with an extraordinary generosity of spirit and a belief in its fundamental values as the Soviet empire collapsed, as the dictatorships of right and left collapsed across Europe, and as we forged a European Union and a Europe that was once again whole and free. That was an extraordinary achievement. But we have to be honest with ourselves and with our people that that achievement of the 20th century will not suffice for the 21st century and for the Europe of 2014. It's not enough. That's why David Cameron talks about in the UK as having a, kind of a wafer-thin level of support for the European Union. And it's not just in the UK. I mean, with all due respect to my colleagues, yeah, I want the United Kingdom to remain a strong and active part of a strong and active European Union. But this debate isn't just happening in the United Kingdom. You know, wake up, guys, smell the coffee, look at the results in France this week, look at what's going to happen next May uh, in those uh, European elections. We have a problem in Europe. And the worst thing that we can do as Europeans who believe, who believe in the European Union is to pretend that it's not happening, that the people don't have a concern. It isn't just about the European Union. You're right. It's not just about the European Union. It's about politics in our member states. It's about disquiet, about what's happening in their lives. It's about those 26 million Europeans who are out of work today. It's about, as Case said, it's about that sense that the opportunity that we have enjoyed as a generation, which our parents have enjoyed, are not going to be available to our children unless we act now. Unless we act now in terms of jobs and growth, in terms of, in terms of action against climate change, and in terms of the insecurity that has returned uh, to Europe just in recent weeks. So we need a vision. We need a new vision for Europe. We need a new vision for a new European Commission that's going to be chosen this year. And my colleagues are right, absolutely right, that we, as we forge that new vision for Europe, as we forge that new vision for, for the European Commission, we need to do things differently in Europe. Yeah? We need better Europe, not more Europe. Not my words, the words of the Italian Prime Minister this week in London. We need a Europe that's big on the big things, smaller on the small things. Not my words, the words of President Barroso, the European Commission. 
We need a Europe that rediscovers its democratic legitimacy amongst the people of Europe. And Case is absolutely right to suggest that part of that solution has to lie in a more active role for national parliaments. And in this week of great football, at least great football by Spanish teams, I'm going to leave aside Chelsea's performance. <laughs> in this week of great football, we need to think again about how we use the yellow card, as we call it, that's available to national parliaments currently, that is underused by national parliaments currently, and we need to think about whether we need a red card that national parliaments can use that can say, actually, no. A majority of national parliaments say that this piece of legislation is unnecessary, it doesn't respect subsidiarity, and it's going to harm jobs and growth in Europe. We need to have that debate about what is the proper legitimacy of the European Union and how we reconnect Europe with its people. And Alejandro is quite right that we face, as we forge that new vision and as we forge that new way of doing things across Europe, we face a whole series of challenges. We face the challenge of increased insecurity. We face the challenge of climate change. We face the challenge of energy insecurity and how we forge a new energy security for Europe in the years ahead. But at the heart of that challenge that we face as Europeans and as a European Union lies the economy. That has to be our number one concern as Europeans. Another hunter is quite right to point to the extraordinary achievements uh, of the Eurozone over the last couple of years in establishing, not completing, but establishing the basis for a genuinely sustainable European, uh, Eurozone. And we in the UK, and some, there is a little bit of uncertainty about this, so let me just be absolutely clear about this. It is in the United Kingdom's national interest that the Eurozone stabilises, succeeds, and grows. That is where the majority of our exports continue to go, and you, the members of the Eurozone, are our partners in a common European project. So we want to see the Eurozone succeed. We think it's vital that the measures that the Eurozone has taken over the, over the last couple of years move ahead, and they do so, as others have said, in a way that respects the integral character of the single market, that respects decision-making at 28, when those decisions have to be taken at 28, according to the treaties. But that effort has to succeed in the interests uh, of us all. But I'm afraid those efforts to stabilise the Eurozone, to give the Eurozone the basis for it to uh, succeed against the sort of shocks that witnessed in 20, uh, 2008, are not sufficient. I'm afraid while we've been busily kind of working out the kind of structures of banking union and the rest, the rest of the world has been moving on apace, guys. You know, and Case and others have pointed it, but let's just remind ourselves of some of those statistics. 26 million Europeans out of work, 10% of the workforce. Five and a half Europeans under the age of 25 out of work. 22% of under 25s across Europe. One in five. That is not sustainable. It's not morally just and we need to act. And in the last six years, while we've been trying to kind of stabilise ourselves, while Europe's growth has basically gone flat overall, India's has grown by a third. China's has grown by 70%. In 1984, Asia made up one-eighth of the world economy. Today, it makes up one-third, and every single day, it's getting bigger and bigger as a proportion uh, of that global economy. The share of patents produced within the European Union has fallen by 50% over the last 10 years. What price the world's most competitive knowledge-based economy that we set out in the Lisbon European Council. Where is the European Google? Where is the European Samsung? Where is the European WhatsApp? You know, we need to be able to create new businesses and we need to enable those new businesses to grow. And when I talk to young entrepreneurs here in Spain and back in the UK, what they say is, you need to help us create the wealth with which we can sustain the European social model. And I'm afraid we're not doing it right now. We're not doing it. 
There isn't a single market in energy. We all know that. There isn't a single market in telecoms. There isn't a single market in digital services. There isn't a single market in services. Yeah. What are we doing about it as Europeans? What are we going to do to create the conditions in which European entrepreneurs can get out and create the jobs that can put Europe back to work? That, that is the vision for Europe over the next few years. We need to make a reality of a European single market. We need to create a European ecosystem that will sustain the growth of the 21st century and that will enable us to compete in this global race of the 21st century. And we need a Europe that has confidence in itself. And that surely is the lesson of the last few weeks, as some of my colleagues have suggested. A Europe that is, after all, the world's single largest single market. 500 million consumers across Europe. A Europe that remains a beacon of liberty and the rule of law in an uncertain world. Be confident, Europeans, that we have a future and is a future that we can forge for ourselves if we have the confidence to build it. If we have the confidence in our people, in our businesses, and we enable them to grow and prosper in this world. If we create the free trade agreements with the United States, with Japan, with Mercosur, that our economies so desperately need, that's the British vision for Europe. A Europe that is confident, but is absolutely focused from day one of the new commission on the task of creating growth, creating jobs for all of us in the European Union. Thank you very much. So let all of you remember, you heard it here first, 3rd of April 2014, this British vision for Europe. <coughs> okay, we have, it's uh, quarter past one, and we have about half an hour for our debate. Uh, I think we have a microphone in the room. Tenemos micrófonos en la sala, y por favor, no duden en preguntar las preguntas que tengan en el idioma que prefieran. Sí, cogeremos tres o cuatro preguntas para empezar. Por favor, si pueden presentarse también para que nuestros ponentes sepan quienes eh, les están interpelando. Muchas gracias. Buenos les ruego también brevedad para que todos podamos tener una oportunidad de hablar. Brevedad, gracias. Buenos días, soy Federico Gianni, vicepresidente de Eurodefense España. Eh, únicamente se ha referido a la política exterior, de alguna manera la embajadora de Suecia, pero ninguno de los embajadores ha tratado el tema de la cómo se escribe en defense policy, la política común de seguridad y defensa. Tuvimos en diciembre un Consejo Europeo muy interesante, había grandes expectativas que luego no se han plasmado de la manera que esperábamos, puesto que solo se han decidido cosas sobre capacidades, que es interesante, sobre la industria de defensa, cosas interesantes también, pero no se han definido ni los objetivos, ni cómo la, esa política va a ser, como se dice, complementaria con la OTAN, pero no se dice cómo, y eso sigue abierto, y esto lo demuestra además cómo es posible que ahora pues, no, se, no, se, no seamos capaces de reaccionar ante situaciones como las que se han presentado en el este del continente. Por otro lado, tengo una pequeña observación que hacer, que me, la cabeza me dice, no lo hagas, Federico, pero el corazón me dice, hazlo. Y es, ¿qué visión para Europa podemos tener si todavía en nuestra continente, en esta península, hay una colonia de un país amigo y miembro de la comunidad? Muchas gracias. Yo te habría dicho no lo hagas, Federico, pero bueno. Eh, gracias, Federico. Richard Youngs, por favor, en esta parte de la sala. Vamos a coger tres o cuatro preguntas, si os parece. So, so it's a consensus that in the future the vision of Europe has to be built on principles of legitimacy and accountability and responsiveness and flexibility. But I just wonder if the solutions being put forward are anywhere like near being enough. I mean, Subsidiarity has been around for 20 years now and it hasn't prevented things getting worse. I just think, I mean, if a flexible model of Europe probably requires a slightly more fundamental change than this rather technical uh, principle of subsidiarity. Uh, giving more powers to the European Parliament um, is rather questionable, one could say, when the Parliament is very disconnected from citizens. I even think the idea of, that national parliaments could be a kind of panacea is questionable when national parliaments themselves are more disconnected from citizens. So I probably agree with the diagnosis, but I think all the solutions that are being put forward are really kind of fine-tuning the current model of integration. They're not really proposing qualitative changes. So I just wonder if there was further thinking that um, the ambassadors would suggest of how we actually look for rather more far-reaching changes. Okay, let me take 
a question from the back of the room. And in the meantime, let me tell you that Richard, who used to be director of Friede, is now at Carnegie Europe. And he has just written an excellent book, which you must all immediately <laughs> download or purchase. I forget which is the option. <laughs> on the dilemmas facing European uh, foreign policy. Gracias. Buenos días, soy María Rey, periodista de Antena 3 Televisión. Eh, después de escuchar el corazón de Federico, me van a disculpar, pero tengo que preguntarles qué papel juega Europa para resolver conflictos como el que eh, España mantiene con el Reino Unido acerca de eh, Gibraltar. Y quería preguntar al embajador si, eh, después del último conflicto que ha habido por el uso de las aguas de Gibraltar por un barco en las últimas horas, ya ha mantenido algún encuentro con el embajador Margallo, si va a reunirse con él, si ya ha hablado con él. Muchas gracias. Oh dear. Um, okay. Vamos a contestar la pregunta sobre defensa, en primer lugar, que planteaba Federico. So you seem to be the protagonist here. Uh, well, <laughs> not being a member of NATO, I, I <laughs> could probably say we would like to see the European Union move in, uh, which we don't. Uh, well, we think there is room to strengthen also the defense cooperation. Uh, and, well, very recently, uh, when we talk about um, Central African Republic, uh, we have been very vocally thinking that, I mean, the EU has now for a number of years had its battle groups that we have all worked and prepared and they have been ready and, and uh, we have proposed that maybe it's time to use them for some of the missions that uh, have called for, for it. Uh, so we think that there's more to do in that uh, area. We think there are also more to be done, I mean, in cooperation between the de defense industries. Uh, we need to be competitive and, and there, there is further cooperation and, and further division of, of labor to be, to be done there. But we don't think that the European Union should move in and take the role that NATO actually plays uh, very well today. And we may have that debate in Sweden coming uh, in, in the next years to come uh, in, in view of the developments. Uh, so that would shortly be my answer on defense. Okay. Do you want to jump in, please? Maybe a little bit broader about uh, foreign policy. Um, of course, we do not live in a, uh, uh, let's say, a sovereign state uh, called Europe in this sense. All of our countries have their traditions in foreign, traditional foreign policy. But I think we have, uh, we have managed to, um, to, to work quite well on a number of issues. Um, let me give uh, just a few examples. Look at the, um, the, the relations with, with Iran. Uh, thanks to Kathy Ashton and uh, uh, the, uh, the groups surrounding her, uh, we've been able to move quite well uh, uh, there. Of course, uh, a number of issues remain on the table, but at least we have been able to speak with one voice and give it one sense of direction. Um, may I remind also the so-called Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, when Javier Solana was the high representative, I remember very well that all of us, including with strong support from the uh, president of, uh, of Poland at the time and the president of Lithuania, uh, Javier Solana, on behalf of the European Union, was able to help to broker a deal at the time. I'm not saying uh, this was possible this time, uh, also because the situation was uh, rather, rather different. But uh, so there are a number of examples where we've been able to work in a very pragmatic and practical way without big bureaucracies around it. To, to move ahead. And since then, we have been uh, working with the uh, new concepts of foreign policy, uh, a European um, uh, uh, diplomatic service. Uh, we've been working with the, the new instruments that we have. And these things go step by step. And we have to find consensus among ourselves. We have member states with different interests and different views of things. And we have quite a good mechanisms to put all those interests at the table and then hammer out a, a common approach and sometimes even a vision. Thank you. Uh, Richard was a bit skeptical about the things that you all had to say about improving the quality of democratic life in the EU. Justin, would you like to put yeah. him in his place? <laughs> I mean, the, the um, implication of Richard's question is uh, that the existing model is, uh, is flawed and that we need another model. We certainly have problems, but I'm not sure it leads to the conclusion that we need an entirely new model. Um, the, uh, we have a problem of participation, that's very clear. We'll probably see, uh, being somewhat of a pessimist, that uh, our worst fears will be confirmed when we look at the turnout in, on the 25th of May. Um, there are problems in the relationship between um, the national parliaments and the European Parliament, but the fundamental model is sound, and I would 
argue against any um, major uh, efforts to think up of uh, an entirely new model. We have a directly elected um, parliament. Um, it has now co-decision on uh, all of the key issues. Uh, it is uh, facing difficulties itself. Part of the reason, I think, for the difficulties that it, it is facing is because it reflects difficulties that national parliaments are facing. So pretending to ourselves that doing something at, in Europe will solve all our problems at national level, I, I think, is, uh, is, uh, would be wrong. I'm, I'm, I think that um, this is going to be a, a, challenging, um, a challenging election, um, but I don't see this as being either the moment, but nor do I think we, do, we, do we need um, an entirely new institutional model to, to address this issue. Simon, can I ask you to deal with the Gibraltar question? <laughs> We're happy to do that. Uh, I'm always extremely happy to speak to uh, Foreign Minister Garcia Magallo, uh, and uh, just to say uh, that uh, without, I'm sure everybody here does not wish to could be kind of... Uh, uh, get broiled in the latest uh, details of Gibraltar. But let me just be clear. Uh, we have made, been very clear about an incident that occurred uh, this week in British Gibraltarian territorial waters. Uh, my Minister for Europe was very clear yesterday about it. He's been very clear about it uh, this morning in the House of Commons, and I spoke in exactly the same terms uh, to my colleagues from the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, this morning here in Madrid. I suspect that's more than enough uh, from everybody here. Uh, just, just on the question of uh, CSDP, um, I think, you know, the, the, I have to say actually I thought the conclusions from uh, last December were actually rather good conclusions. Perhaps I sort of disagree slightly uh, with that, uh, the gentleman uh, who spoke on that. But I think we also have to just to be aware that not all the power in, in this area really actually lies with the European Union. No, we, we shouldn't be in the, in the role of trying to duplicate the capabilities uh, of NATO. And that's, I think, you know, particularly uh, relevant uh, after the events of recent weeks, nor should we be trying to duplicate the role of the OSCE either. There is a particular role uh, for Europe, and actually I think it's been rather effective in the operations that it's led. And I, I agree with Case. And, you know, in many of the uh, situations that we've been faced, whether it be the Orange Revolution in Ukraine a few years ago, or actually um, some of the more recent uh, problems in, in Bosnia, for example, I think actually uh, the European Union has proved itself a rather capable uh, actor. It needs to do better, clearly, uh, and we need to develop uh, the tools at our disposal. But let's also not forget that in terms of industrial cooperation, we, as you'll know, are one of the countries that's, that's keen to see industrial cooperation uh, uh, flourish in this area because we think that companies working together um, will have more effect. The tools are not necessarily in the hands of the European Union. You know, actually, you know, the biggest single um, move that could have uh, provided that consolidation lay in the hands of companies last year, and those companies chose not to go down that route. As a government, we regretted that. Uh, but just, I think we just have to, to acknowledge that sometimes these are things that also have to be driven by forces outside of the control of the European Union, uh, even if they have benefits for all of us within the European Union. Thank you, Alejandro. Well, gracias, Charles. Simplemente muy, muy brevemente por el tema de Gibraltar, simplemente recordar que la posición del Gobierno de España es que en el Tratado de Utrecht se cedieron eh, las defensas y las aguas interiores del puerto, pero no se cedieron las aguas y, por tanto, España considera que esas aguas son aguas que a la jurisdicción de la soberanía nacional y desearíamos que el Reino Unido entendiera que eso es lo que dice el Tratado de Utrecht y nos gustaría que eso se respetara. ¿no? Yo creo que más allá de los incidentes que, que, hay en la, que hubo ayer en, en las aguas eh, españolas, en torno a yacentes Gibraltar, eh, eh, lo que me parece que pone de manifiesto este tema es, eh, Simon, eh, que realmente, eh, y lo ha dicho la persona que ha formulado la pregunta, ¿no?, que tener una colonia en la península es absolutamente anacrónico. Y es algo que dos países, como, dos países aliados y amigos como Reino Unido y España, que estemos teniendo que hablar de este tema continuamente y sometidos a continuos problemas entre nosotros, por una situación que resulta a todas luces anacrónica, pues no deja de ser algo que nos debería hacer reflexionar en Londres y en Madrid y que nos debería hacer reflexionar para cómo superar esta situación, que yo creo que no es no es aceptable para España eh, y, y, y yo creo que el Reino Unido pues también se ve en situaciones incómodas en la que yo creo que tendríamos mucho que ganar si se tuviera una visión 
de cómo superar este tema y cómo superarlo de acuerdo con el derecho internacional y, con la, y cómo superarlo de acuerdo con lo que es la reintegración a la soberanía nacional del territorio de Gibraltar. Pero, dicho eso, yo, no, yo, yo, yo creo que esto es una prueba de cómo este tema, en el fondo, contamina nuestras relaciones bilaterales y cómo, eh, eh, pues, quizá eh, entender que es anacronismo hay que superarlo, pues nos ayudaría mucho a la Unión de España, a la Unión Europea y probablemente a los que están aquí sentados, que tienen interés en hablar de Europa y no solamente de Gibraltar, aunque el tema de Gibraltar es importante. Sí, yo os rogaría precisamente que hiciéramos eso. Eh, bueno, entonces, entrando, bueno, entrando al tema de la, de la política exterior de seguridad común y sobre todo la política exterior de seguridad de defensa que ha mencionado el, eh, también uno de los participantes, me gustaría decir una cosa. Eh, la Unión Europea, eh, los Estados miembros de la Unión Europea dedicamos un porcentaje a la defensa que es pequeño en términos de PIB nacional, pero que es muy grande si lo comparamos con los recursos que destinan otros socios importantes como son Estados Unidos, ¿no? Y que, sin embargo, la presencia de Europa en los temas de seguridad y defensa es mucho menor y la capacidad de respuesta y actuación europea en términos de seguridad y defensa es mucho menor que tienen otros socios u otros miembros de la comunidad internacional, como Estados Unidos, pero también otros, como Rusia u otros. ¿no? Y eso nos debería hacer pensar en Europa a cómo construir un mercado común de la defensa, a cómo fomentar una base industrial y tecnológica para la defensa europea, a cómo eh, eh, tener una capacidad de comando operativa y de control de operaciones eh, de defensa. Eh, y eso es algo a lo que probablemente el Consejo Europeo de Defensa del pasado mes de diciembre pues se, quedó, se quedó corto. Y se quedó corto, yo creo que por una razón, fundamentalmente, porque las ideas que puso la Comisión sobre la mesa fueron ideas que a muchos de los socios que se sientan en el Consejo Europeo pues les parecieron que eran demasiado ambiciosas. Pero yo creo que hay, un, hay, un, hay algo sobre lo que hay que reflexionar. ¿eh? ¿Tiene sentido eh, tener una industria de defensa atomizada en cada Estado miembro o te, que no es competitiva, que tiene grandes problemas en las, en, las, en, las, eh, en las cuentas de resultado de esas empresas? ¿O tendría sentido llegar a un proceso de consolidación industrial que pudiera ser un, una base industrial y tecnológica que ayudara a las Fuerzas Armadas de los diferentes Estados miembros? Yo creo que es una reflexión que tenemos que hacer. ¿no? Y si me permite echar muy brevemente, porque también se ha mencionado y creo que es importante, eh, se ha hablado del tema de la subsidiariedad. Yo, en el tema de la subsidiariedad, eh, simplemente una cosa, a veces se menciona como que fuera la panacea a los problemas de Europa. Yo, sinceramente, creo que la subsidiariedad es muy importante. Están los tratados, hay un protocolo número dos que se refiere al papel de los parlamentos nacionales sobre cómo mejorar el control de la subsidiariedad, pero sinceramente... Cuando estamos muy de acuerdo todos en las grandes palabras sobre Europa, una Europa unida, una Europa fuerte, una Europa con gran proyección exterior, una Europa que contribuye a la apertura de mercados exteriores, una Europa con un mercado único eh, operativo, un, un mercado interior de la energía operativa y funciona, etcétera, etcétera, sinceramente, hablar de subsidiariedad parece que está bien. Todos estamos de acuerdo con la subsidiariedad. Ahora, ¿es la, ¿es la panacea? ¿Es el gran tema? Yo tengo mis dudas. ¿no? El embajador de Canadá. Just following up on on, uh, on what was, uh, was said uh, by Alejandro, uh, Simon, you, you talked about the need for single market in energy, in services, in telecoms. We talked about defense procurement, and sometimes from the outside one gets the impression, of course, that we're we're all trying to compete against India and China and, and the United States to some extent, but but Europe seems to have its foot one foot in Europe and one foot um, trying to protect its, its national industries and not coming together. I mean, isn't there an argument that you do need more Europe in order to get those four or five single markets and start proc procuring together as opposed to less Europe and national government decisions? Let me take an, a question from Andres Ortega, Senior Research Fellow at the Elcano Institute. Eh, estas son unas elecciones que por primera vez se está hablando de verdad de Europa. Eh, pero no estoy seguro que el resultado influya en a, a qué, hacia qué Europa vamos. ¿no? Creo que ha sido el embajador irlandés el que ha dicho que changing institutions is different than policy changes. Y hay un tema que, por ejemplo, se habla pero no se discute en estas elecciones, que es el cambio de los tratados. Eh, los alemanes están diciendo, no, esto es para después de las elecciones. Es decir, que que se está engañando un poco al, al, al público, ¿no? a, a los ciudadanos. Yo creo que, que, le, que, le, que estas elecciones van a influir bastante 
en los resultados en, en, en las políticas nacionales respecto a Europa y respecto a las políticas nacionales. Entonces, mi, mi pregunta sería cómo creen que va a influir o en qué va a cambiar las políticas nacionales de sus países hacia Europa después de estas elecciones. Eh, señor Maura, eh, candidato de UPyD, como antes he hecho propaganda del libro de Richard Young, hago también propaganda del libro de Andrés Ortega, que acaba de publicar un excelente ensayo sobre los dilemas a los que se enfrenta la democracia española. Adelante. Gracias, Charles. Mi pregunta es eh, en relación con la inmigración. ¿Consideran los eh, embajadores que el problema de la inmigración afecta eh, solamente y es problema solo para los países que tenemos fronteras con terceros países eh, que no son de la Unión Europea o es un problema que es de la Unión Europea en su conjunto? Y si consideran eh, que la respuesta es la segunda, ¿qué políticas eh, consideran que deberían emprenderse? Muy bien. Y cogemos una última pregunta de la primera fila. Con brevedad, por favor, para que los embajadores puedan contestar. Gracias. José Antonio Iturriaga, embajador de, de España. Um, the representative of uh, Spain has taken for granted that uh, the member of the European Union wants more Europe rather than less Europe. I'm not so sure about that, especially in the case of the United Kingdom, and I just heard. Uh, that uh, the kingdom wanted evolution, wanted some confidence back to the national state, is uh, going to celebrate a referendum to the, decide about this uh, remaining or not in the European Union. And, uh, well, uh, it has always been out of all, opting out in all the, the policies uh, of uh, greater integration. In the case of Sweden, uh, as I said, that the majority is against the, entering the country, entering the Eurozone. Uh, even in the Netherlands, who has been a stalwart of the European Union, there has been lately restriction in the freedom of movements of persons. Uh, the situation is that, that the, the European Union is, is like a bicycle. You don't stop pedaling, you, you drop from the bicycle. So we need more, more, more Europe. But uh, many of the countries not only want pedaling, but they want to put the reverse and going back to the situation. Uh, final comments, uh, uh, in my capacity as a former ambassador in Ireland, uh, I wouldn't disagree with, with Ambassador Harman that uh, Ireland is a, a, an island behind an island, but I think that psychologically it's no longer so, because it's linkage between Ireland and Europe, and the Europe, continental Europe, let's say, the Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. and, and it would be unthinkable uh, a few years ago that Ireland could join, for instance, the, the Euro, uh, European Union, the Monetary Union and the Euro without the United Kingdom. It was possible, it has been very positive for Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Simon, would you like to? Um, can I just pick up on that last question in particular? The great thing about bicycles, I always think, <laughs> is that they have many speeds and, have, and can, you can change in many different directions. Now, there isn't, yeah, there isn't just one route. You know, nobody kind of uh, has, has preordained the development of European policy. European policy is forged by the member states of the European Union, by the European Commission, by the European Parliament, working together to create those policies. And as we create those policies, we have to listen to our people and we have to look out beyond Europe to what's happening in the wider world. And if that means that we have to do things a little bit differently over the next few years, if we have to focus, as I've suggested, on doing the big things in a big way and the smaller things in a smaller way, as President Barroso has said, if we have to think about cutting back on the red tape that's actually preventing our firms from becoming the European Googles and Samsungs of the future, well, then let's do it. If we have to create a genuine single market in services, in digital, in telecoms, in energy, where it doesn't exist, then we should do it. That's not a backward vision for Europe. That's a forward vision for Europe that says, let's realize the challenges we face from our people and from that global economic race in which we find ourselves. Let's have the confidence to create a Europe that is strong, competitive, and democratically legitimate in the eyes of its people. Thank you. Cecilia is going to answer the question about immigration. Well, no, no, I'd like to comment we on it. Uh, and uh, I think that it's, it's a very good example for where we need the whole European Union. And 
I, I know that the, the debate here in Spain is very much focused on the pressure on the southern borders and <clears throat> seeing the sort of flooding of people that are coming up from, from Africa trying to enter Europe through, through Spain and uh, through Greek, Greece and, and I think Italy is also taking a lot of it. And I think the whole of the European Union is happily participating in how, how can we help with that and we have Frontex and we have other instruments. Uh, there's another part of the immigration stream uh, where we maybe from a Swedish point of view, would like to see a little bit more interest and solidarity among other member states. And that's when it comes to accommodating a lot of the people that are coming from outside the European Union. Sweden, for example, has received 30,000 Syrians since the crisis in Syria started. Uh, would be helpful if other countries in the European would accommodate uh, some of the refugees from, from the crisis. So I think that's a perfect subject for European cooperation. We need to talk about it, but we need to talk about all the aspects of, of the immigration uh, streams. Uh, and I think this is an issue that we need to also take into the European Parliament debate. I mean, we all have in our countries anti-immigration parties, or in many of our countries we have it. Uh, we have the Sweden Democrats, uh, and I think we have to discuss the issue in, in, in Sweden. Unfortunately, some of our established parties are afraid of taking the debate with the xenophobic parties because they think they would give them legitimacy. But we need to discuss the issue. And there are lots of studies made, uh, made I think, by the Commission. We have made it by experts in Sweden and in other countries actually the benefit that a lot of the, the immigrants bring to our country, and we are an aging continent, we actually need some inflow. And, and we have also looked at the migration flows from the new member states, uh, because there's a lot of talk about maybe we should limit some of the free labor because it's social tourism. Uh, and our studies show that the, that's a myth. In, in Sweden, they have contributed positively uh, to, to ours. And I just wanted to comment on, on Simon's sort of need for confidence in Europe. I don't think we lack confidence. I think we should have confidence. And I think we have some very good companies that have come up even in the last few years. We have companies also in the IT sector like Skype and Spotify and others uh, that are doing very well. So I think we have confidence and I think we should show that. I agree with you. Thank you. Cornelius. Um, on uh, uh, movement or freedom of movement, uh, there was a remark made about that. Um, I think the, the issue there is not so much the freedom of movement as such, because that is a, a holy principle, I would say, in the uh, European Union internal market and so on. Uh, the issue here is um, um, the, the, the problem of, um, let's say, uh, citizens or workers from member states that have, let's say, much lower salary levels and to work in countries with higher salary levels and better social protection, mm -hmm. undercut through agencies in some third countries of uh, the European Union, uh, undercut the, the workforce uh, in the, uh, let's say, in the Netherlands, right? We have a number of problems there, and my Minister of Social Affairs had not, has not said that he wants to limit the uh, freedom of movement within the Union, but he wants really to take apart those uh, malafid uh, agencies that, uh, that undercut the, uh, the social protection that exists happily in my country, uh, and which undermines basically also the belief of uh, quite a number of citizens in my countries that Europe is a good thing. And this is very crucial. Uh, Europe cannot be used to undercut the, uh, let's say, the, the social requirements, the social levels that we have built up over the decades and uh, which is protected in a way by European legislation, but which should not be undercut by the negative sides of it. And those illegal malafide agencies that undercut those, uh, those uh, protections, they should, be, they should be handled. And of course, this is a national uh, uh, responsibility of each member state according to its legislation. But what is necessary is to exchange information about that to cut away those possibilities of those who have, let's say, well, less well-intentioned uh, policies or, or ways to make money uh, to, to destroy the belief in the, in the internal market. That is basically the issue that is at hand, and I think it's crucial. On the point of subsidiarity, subsidiarity, and I, it's, I'm coming back to a remark that was made previously by the gentleman in the third row there, um, I don't believe subsidiarity is a technical issue at all. I think it's highly political, it has to do with a kind of hierarchy of norms and rules and legislation we have 
it's very normal when one looks at the Constitution of the United States, where you have a number of principles that are above everything, and then you have laws and you have administrative rules to implement things. There is a kind of hierarchy. Um, now, that has not been possible in the European treaties because, after all, there are treaties, so everything from the highest principle to the lowest protocol somewhere in an annex has the same legal force or the same legal significance. So it's not been possible to, tr to turn that into a uh, kind of constitutional text, mm -hmm. as we have known, of course, in, since 2005. Uh, but what is possible is to put a certain, uh, a, a certain separation between things that are really important uh, that we have to do together as Europeans, uh, where European solutions are um, absolutely essential to make the, 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 the policy work, and, let's say, questions of proportionality, of implementation, uh, that sh should be done at the level of member states, or even at the level of a, of a province uh, within, or, or the level of a, a commune, or a city, or a, a village. It's very essential to to uh, organize that better, to make that work better at the European level, national level, and sub-national level, uh, for people to recognize who does what. Because now, this is the essential point of my intervention, we, our citizens, very often do not know, do not know who is responsible and why it happens the way it happens. Subsidiarity is essential in that. It's a difficult word, but it basically means who does what. Richard is actually a world expert on subsidiarity, so perhaps you can uh, develop this conversation further later. Justin. No, just very briefly on, um, on the issue of migration. Um, the short answer I would make is yes, it's clear this, there has to be a, a, a European response. There are the countries that are most uh, exposed, in, including Spain, for, for obvious reasons. But there has been, of course, a dramatic uh, uh, change that has taken place uh, demographically. Um, this has been pointed out by, by Cecilia. Uh, and um, there cannot be a response other than on the basis of um, the, um, the European Union acting together. Uh, in the case of Ireland, a population which was homogeneous until relatively recently and now has a, a foreign-born population of between 11 and 12%. This is in a very short period of time. Um, despite the, the crisis, um, there is a continuing flow of, of people coming into the country. Um, this, this is another reason why we need not just simply to focus on the immediate issues that are, that are facing the most exposed countries, but um, uh, at, the, at the wider level. Just very briefly, could I come back to Andres's point because uh, on, on treaty change, uh, and just to say I fully agree with what you said about Andres's analysis in the new book because it is a superb uh, 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 analysis of the, the issues facing Spain. Um, but he, he was suggesting, if I understood uh, it correctly, that somehow or another, um, without dealing, we're, we're, not, we're somehow deceiving the public if we don't deal with the issue of future treaty change in the context of the European elections. And I fear that there is a risk here of uh, jumping um, before, before we're, we're, we're quite, uh, we, we, we really need to, to take this step. First of all, um, we have a treaty basis. What, what, are, what are the reasons that the argument about treaty change is coming? First of all, there's the issue of the debate in the UK. Leave, it, leave that aside. The other is, what treaty change is needed to make sure that the Eurozone functions uh, more effectively. We're not convinced that the moment has arrived for um, treaty change. Uh, many other partners, uh, I think, share that view. And all of us believe that there are uh, significant possibilities within the uh, existing treat uh, treaties. And uh, we think it could be quite damaging for Europe if we now make this leap it will be distracting, probably quite divisive, and it will um, certainly distract us from um, the issues which are immediately uh, at hand relating to, uh, relating to recovery. Thank you very much. It's, um, I'm afraid it's 10 to 2, and um, all, must, all good things must come to an end. Our goal this morning, as you know, was to have a, an interesting conversation about the future of Europe, and I think we have achieved our goal. So would you please um, join me in thanking our speakers for their excellent contributions this morning. And we will be organizing a debate on Gibraltar if you really insist. <laughs>